Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Liquid Chromatography Tandem Mass Spectrometry Research in Testosterone Analysis, Considerations of Instrument Performance versus Sample Preparation Complexity, presented by Dr. Joshua Hayden, Assistant Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. And it's made possible today by our sponsor, Agilent Technologies. Agilent is a leader in life sciences, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets. The company provides laboratories worldwide with instruments, services, consumables, applications, and expertise, enabling customers to gain the insight they seek. Agilent's expertise and trusted collaboration gives customers the highest confidence in the company's solution. For more information about our sponsor, visit their site at www.agilent.com. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on that green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, notice that you're viewing this presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing, or hearing the presentation, click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window and use that Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. Good news, this educational presentation is offering education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left-hand corner and follow the process to obtain those credits. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Joshua Hayden. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, Dr. Hayden. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining us. As mentioned, we are going to be talking today about this molecule here called testosterone and how we measure it, why we need to measure it, and some different approaches to consider. I'm sure many of you in the research and non-research setting might already be measuring testosterone. So I wanted to start with a quick poll question just to figure out how is everybody measuring testosterone? You can see, are you performing by GCMS, maybe LCMS? No, you're not performing any testosterone testing by mass spectrometry, which you plan to in the future. Or no, I'm not currently doing mass spectrometry-based measurements of testosterone in the lab, and I have no plans to in the future. I always think it's helpful to start with a poll question so I can see who all is, is awake and, and paying attention. Right? So what are some of the reasons that we might want to be measuring mass uh, testosterone by mass spectrometry? You might have noticed on my first slide next to the testosterone was a figure showing deaths from cancer in the United States uh, in males. And prostate cancer ranked number two with a little over 26,000 deaths annually, over 160,000 new cases per year. And statistics show that about one in seven men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. Now, primarily, this is going to be older individuals, with 60% of them or more being diagnosed over 65. And so there's a real need to understand when and how to treat prostate cancer, especially given the morbidities associated with the treatment and the age of individuals suffering from it. One treatment option which has come about is androgen deprivation therapy, which is illustrated here. Um, this is reproduced from a recent Nature Review and Urology. The idea is relatively straightforward. So intracellular androgen concentrations, that's going to be testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, are known to drive prostate cancer growth through interactions with the androgen receptor and subsequent downstream interactions. So the goal here is to start to lower the androgen levels in an effort to stop or slow tumor growth. Now, there are multiple pathways to reducing androgen levels. 
Uh, one of the first and most prevalent would be luteinizing hormone releasing hormone agonists, which are going to stop systemic production of the androgens. I should point out, point out here that the majority of the androgens are going to be synthesized by the testes, but they can also be produced by the adrenal glands. Even if we start to inhibit this, we can still have production of androgens within the cells. And so we have developed inhibitors of CYP17, which can actually inhibit the intracellular synthesis. I should mention that inhibiting intracellular synthesis, we care the most about the dihydrotestosterone. So while testosterone is most commonly measured because it's a great systemic uh, source of the dihydrotestosterone, the most active is actually the dihydrotestosterone. Uh, this is very similar to how we generally are going to measure T4, even though within the cells T3 is far more active. Now, there are newer ways to block uh, downstream elements, such as androgen receptor antagonists, as shown there. Um, and then there are more extreme androgen deprivation therapies, which involve triple androgen blockade and have the inclusion of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors to prevent that intracellular conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Now, all of these therapies are going to carry substantial negative sequelae. And so the questions which persist are, who do we have to treat? When do we treat? How do we treat? How long to continue treating? Obviously, our goal here is improving morbidity and mortality from these treatments. And how do we know if we're actually doing that? How are we measuring response to these treatments and improvement in morbidity and mortality? There were some early suggestions that lower systemic testosterone levels following androgen deprivation therapy portended lower mortality, um, with subcastrate levels, that being testosterone below 20 nanograms per deciliter, or 0 0.7 nanomoles per liter for those uh, more comfortable with those units, was actually superior to the supracastrate levels. That would be testosterone levels around 50 nanograms per deciliter, or 1.7 nanomoles per liter. The strongest data for this actually came from a study shown here, where they had 626 men with a median follow-up of eight years and they wanted to see how the death hazard ratio changed relative to the nadir levels of testosterone, nadir level being the lowest level of achieved response. And you can see in the curves, if the individuals reached a nadir testosterone of 20 nanograms per deciliter or less, the hazard ratio was 1. If the testosterone only went down to 49 nanograms per deciliter or greater, the hazard ratio was almost 3. It's important to point, point out that this was observational. Right? They found lower testosterone was corresponding with lower mortality. They did not investigate whether intervening to actively lower testosterone actually lowered mortality. So a lot of questions still persist. Further research is needed, uh, not the least of which is this question of whether it's systemic testosterone levels or intratumoral testosterone levels. and how are we actually even supposed to be testing these low levels? Now, that one is especially of interest to me as a clinical chemist. I find myself often most interested with how we measure things. So what are our options for measuring testosterone? Well, the most commonly used will be direct testosterone immunoassays. So I'm showing some data here from my lab where you can see on the x-axis is results from a tandem mass spectrometry-based measurement of testosterone, and on the y-axis is results from an immunoassay. I should mention this is a commercially available direct immunoassay, but it's one which is fairly well vetted. This is not an off-the-shelf ELISA. This is the type of immunoassay that would be used in many clinical labs across the country. And notice, below 40 nanograms per deciliter, we really have this cloud of data. And I'm highlighting in the red circle, if we look at a person with a testosterone level by this immunoassay, um, or by the mass spec, who has a testosterone below 20 nanograms per deciliter, what is their true testosterone? 
and what is the hazard ratio of this patient, right? Is it one or is it three? And you can tell that a testosterone level down below 10 by mass spec could be as high as 50 by this amino assay. Now, I'm not just cherry picking one really bad direct amino assay. The same criticism could be leveled on a range of amino assays in use. So this is data taken out of a 2003 clinical chemistry paper. This was used with permission from AACC. And we can see the performance of four commercial direct amino assays versus mass spectrometry. In this case, this would be isotope dilution gas chromatography mass spectrometry. On the x-axis is going to be the true testosterone level, in this case in nanomoles per liter. And on the y-axis, we're going to have the ratio. So that would be the result from the indicated amino assay divided by the result from the mass spec. So a ratio of 1 would indicate excellent agreement. The farther from 1, the greater the discrepancy. And you can see, for a large number of men, the filled in black circles, we have relatively good agreement with ratios around 1. However, as you get to the female population, so this would be the open circles with levels down below 10 nanomoles per liter or below 280 some nanograms per deciliter, you can see that the ratios change substantially. Right? And so those ratios in general are going to be biased. You can see some bias high up to three over four fold difference, while some for one amino assay, amino assay three, for instance, will also have some negative bias. So this isn't a universal bias that we can just adjust our values. And this work led to this really nice publication by Dave Harold, Rob Fitzgerald, which talked about whether or not these amino assays are actually any better than just a random guess. Right? And you'll notice one of the amino assays I've chosen here is the ACS180. This is notable because it's been used as the predicate method for all but one FDA-approved direct testosterone amino assay that I know of. So this is the standard by which many assays in the clinical lab are actually held to. And that's a problem. You also note the terrible performance of all these assays in the female patient population. It's not just men with prostate cancer undergoing androgen deprivation therapy where we care about accurate low-level testosterone. Right? These accurate low-level measurements are important in women, especially as part of the workup for polycystic ovary syndrome, as well as for children who generally fall into these low testosterone measures. And accurate quantitation is important in cases of precocious or delayed puberty, unexplained virilization, and newborns with ambiguous genitalia. All of these situations are going to represent scenarios in which accurate, low-level testosterone measures are important. And we know these are important. We also know that they can be inaccurate at these low levels. Right? So what are we going to do about this? So this brings up another polling question I had, just because I'm always curious to see how individuals deal with this in their labs. So will your laboratory report low-level testosterone results, let's say below 50 nanograms per deciliter, from a direct immunoassay? And there are options, of yes, uh, yes, but maybe you append a comment stating the limitation of those low levels. Yes, but maybe you differentiate between women and children and won't report for certain genders or ages. Or no, my lab simply will not report direct testosterone immunoassay results below 50 nanograms per deciliter. So as you think about this, it's, it's worth pointing out that a number of others are thinking about how we address these inaccuracies at the low level. So fortunately, the Endocrine Society um, has actually come out with some very clear guidelines. So this is taking uh, an excerpt from their position statement in 2007, where they comment that the technology exists to perform accurate, precise, reproducible assays for testosterone and af assays after extraction chromatography, followed either by MS or immunoassay, are likely to furnish more reliable results and are preferred. Right. So there's a few things about this statement that I really like. The first is that comment that the technology exists, which always has me thinking about that 
six million dollar man um, opening where they say we can rebuild them, we have the technology or however that goes, right? But it's an important statement because what we're addressing here is not an intractable problem. It is possible for laboratories to report accurate, precise, reproducible testosterone levels even at these low levels, right? And the first part is to start avoiding these inaccurate assays that perform so poorly, such as in women, children, hypogonadal men. Right? You also notice that um, you can use either the MS or the immunoassay following the extraction. So radioimmunoassays have been shown to work incredibly well. Now, not many of us are going to want to use radioimmunoassays, right? That's another one of the reasons mass spec has become so popular. Now, this position statement is geared at patient care, right? but there's a very important question to ask, which is how can we use these poor performing assays in the research setting? How can we expect to obtain meaningful results that can be translated into clinical practice if we use inaccurate immunoassays? And the reality is you can't. And the Endocrine Society recognizes that. Uh, 2013, they published a statement on steroid measurements in endocrinology research, stating that effective January 2015, any manuscript which used sex steroid assays, such as for testosterone, as important endpoints, have to use MS-based methods, including reporting and citing their methods with sufficient detail to uh, allow reproduction. Right. Um, this is a really great advance, I think, um, getting clinical societies and research societies thinking about where their numbers are coming from and whether or not these are numbers that can be trusted. So now with these guidelines in place, what are we as laboratorians supposed to do? Well, biomass spectrometer, obviously, right? Um, good time to remind you that, that this is sponsored by Agilent, and I'm told operators are standing by, so please call now. Um, no, all, all joking aside, I should mention that you'll be hearing a lot about my lab's experience using Agilent instruments for testosterone. It's what we use, it's what we know. There's lots of other great platforms out there that exist, right? Um, but whenever you're investigating these platforms, you want to try to think about what do you need your instrument to do and you know, really define the problem. I think a good first step is just looking at the assay you want to develop. What are the requirements? What are the challenges? So let's unravel this a bit for testosterone. So testosterone, as shown here, is the primary male sex hormone. It's a gonadocorticoid or gonadosteroid. The core structure is 17 carbons fused into four rings, which you can see labeled A, B, C, D. Now, testosterone in particular is going to have this ketone on the third carbon, a double bond between carbons four and five, and then a hydroxyl group on carbon 17. Overall, this is not a very polar compound, and it's going to circulate almost entirely protein-bound within the body, with only 2% or so free. The majority is going to be tightly bound to a low-abundance protein, a sex hormone binding globulin, with weaker binding to the far more abundant albumin, um, also accounting for a large fraction. So when we talk about testosterone, we can be talking about total testosterone, which is going to be in the range of 10 to 1,000. We can talk about bioavailable testosterone, which is going to be the free testosterone plus the albumin-bound portion. And we can talk about just free testosterone, which is going to be in that 0 0.2 to 20 nanogram per deciliter range. Obviously, what we're trying to measure is going to dictate what we need out of our instruments. I'll be focusing primarily on the total testosterone today. I'll also mention that there are ways that you can calculate the free testosterone using accurate total testosterone measurements and accurate measurements of sex hormone binding globulin and albumin. So if we're going to be doing this by mass spectrometry, right, we want to be thinking about some of our gotchas ahead of time. Right? What are some of the pitfalls we're going to need to worry about? Since we're using MS-based methods, one of the big ones we need to worry about 
are isobaric interferences. So with testosterone, there are two very important ones to be aware of. So the one will be DHEA, which in the sulfated form is going to be present in serum concentrations, orders of magnitude above testosterone. And you can see that DHEA is a structural isomer with the same formula as testosterone, just slightly different arrangement of the atoms. However, the atom arrangement is really only slightly different, so it's something you're going to want to be aware of when you're developing your chromatographic method. You're going to want to make sure you're getting good separation here. In addition to the structural isomer, there's also a stereo isomer. This will be the epitestosterone. Here, the only difference is that hydroxyl group on carbon-17 is in a different configuration. This is very similar to 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which has an epimer and non-epimeric form. And just like in 25-hydroxy, our goal is accurate measurement of the non-epimeric form. Now, certainly measurement of total testosterone and the epimer are important in other applications. Um, Sports doping, USADA would care very much about this. Um, it's not something I'm going to spend much time talking about. Now, in addition to these biological isobars, there are some other concerns that you want to be aware of before embarking on this sort of assay. So there's isobars just from the gel tubes. Right? What I'm showing here is a plasma separator tube or, tube, or PST, but we see similar results from SSTs, where if you let serum or plasma sit on top of that gel, and then you analyze it, what you're looking at is a chromatogram for a sample that contains about 10 nanogram per deciliter testosterone, and that's labeled with the star and the little red TE above it, and those giant peaks which dwarf that symbol are all isobaric interferences from those gels. Right? So whenever you're going to let samples sort of stew on these thixotropic polymeric gels, it's something you want to think carefully about before injecting that on your instrument. Right? These gel tubes are an array of chemicals, viscous liquids, organics, inorganic fillers, tachyphires, all of which have the possibility to interfere with sample analysis. How you choose to deal with this, um, whether it's through clear separation of the interferences with chromatography, just not allowing gel tubes in your lab, that's certainly your choice, but it's definitely an issue that has to be dealt with. Right? And these are some of those major interferences we're going to want to think about. So what are other analytic requirements of our testosterone assay? So fortunately, a lot of great work has already gone into standardizing testosterone measurements. There were clearly defined performance criteria from the CDC as part of their hormone standardization program, or the HOST program. Right? This is all supported by formation of the Partnership for Accurate Testing of Hormones, led by Endocrine Society with collaboration of NIH, FDA, and, and CDC. Right? And what the CDC has said in collaboration with them is that the performance criterion will be plus or minus 6.4% mean bias relative to the CDC testosterone reference method, which is an LCMS-MS method. And you want to be able to go over the concentration range of 2.5 to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. Now, the certification will happen in two phases. The first step is what they term calibration. Here you can receive 40 serum samples with reference value assignments. These samples are going to be non-polled single donor sera from male and female donors. And they help you assess the accuracy of your test, as well as adjusting your calibration if necessary. Once you feel comfortable in your method, then you're able to move on to phase two, which is the method bias assessment. Here you will have four quarterly challenges, each containing 10 blind samples, which you'll run the unknown serum samples for analysis and report the values, and then the CDC will assess your bias. If you fall within the plus or minus 6.4%, then you get listed on the website. Right? Now, these sorts of standardization endeavors are a tremendous amount of work, and they're also tremendously helpful in the field. And I would say as a clinical chemist, anytime I know that there is one of these standardization programs, I always feel like that is the standard I should try to, to hold myself to. 
And so I would definitely advocate anybody thinking about developing a mass spectrometry base assay for testosterone should consider standardization in the CDC host program. If you're not going to, you can also just get the phase one calibration samples so that you can have a good sense how your method is performing. Because um, there's a number of factors that can affect it, which we're not going to have a chance to talk about in this webinar. Um, so important factors would include your internal standard choice. Uh, we make this assumption that everywhere our analyte goes and everything that happens to the analyte, our an internal standard goes and happens to that. And that's just not always the case for testosterone. In particular, deuterated testosterone can have some stability um, and issues. Uh, so kind of take home message would definitely be to go with a carbon 13 of three mass unit difference. I assure you, even though you might look at the initial costs over the lifespan of your assay, it's really pennies. The next major issue is going to be calibration. So all the best method development in the world is only going to help you ensure accurate signal response. And it's your calibration curve that converts that signal response into a concentration which means best, best method in the world with an inaccurate calibration curve gives inaccurate methods. Right? Some good pointers here, try to use matrix match calibrators. Organic solvent is not appropriate for a calibrator if you're doing a serum-based measurement. Um, and also, you're going to want to, whenever possible, try to let someone else do the QC right, work. Right. So if you can find something commercially available which approximates your matrix. Not always easy, given that uh, endogenous compounds like testosterone are going to be in any serum. But there are options for this. So now we know what kind of assay we're trying to develop. Right? What's our next step? So the next step is defining what you need from your instrument. Right? So let's say we decide that we want accurate mass, excellent quantitation over a broad dynamic range, which works equally well for small and large molecules. It needs to be robust, low cost, and ideally it makes us coffee in the morning, right? So now we have defined what we want. The next obvious step, compromise, right? It's like I always tell my wife, she knows exactly what she wants, but then she settled for me, and that's just how life goes sometimes, right? There is no perfect instrument. Now, there are instruments that can make our lives more or less enjoyable. And what do I mean by enjoyable? Enjoyable, I mean an instrument that facilitates robust analysis to help us meet the desired analytic specifications of our assay. And in theory, this should be relatively easy, right? Mass spectrometers make ions and measure ions. All we need is for it to make testosterone an ion and measure that ion, right? It should be a match made in heaven. Unfortunately, that's not really the case, right? There's a lot of steps, and by steps I mean an obstacle course between your compound in serum to it becoming an ion, and from that ion actually reaching your detector and generating a response, right? You can think of this obstacle course like the, the pyramid from American Gladiators, or if you're a little younger, maybe something out of Ninja Warrior, right? So when I talk about a better instrument, I'm talking about an instrument that helps these ions overcome this obstacle course. So getting a little more scientific, right? This is a schematic I took of, of a triple quadruple, right? You can see from LC exit to the detector. Now I have to say too often when I would show a mass spectrometer schematic, it would basically just be a couple quadruples with some sort of approximated collision cell in the middle. And more than anything, this webinar was me wanting to understand all those other pieces in a mass spectrometer and how they impact the sensitivity of our instruments. Because as it turns out, there's been a lot of changes and advances um, in many of those non-triple quadrupole steps, such as the ion optics, the octopole guides, sampling, etc., cetera, um, which I hope to better understand and maybe try to mention to you here. Once again, I'm talking about the instruments I know. Many vendors have seen great improvements, um, and it's really good to be speaking with them about what improvements went into it, right? Because the reality is that every ion you want that's lost by your instrument plus every ion you don't want that gets through, that equals sample prep. Right? And that's really what we're coming down to here. Right? This is the trade-off that we're always facing. 
With a better instrument, we can sometimes let ourselves get a little lazy on sample prep. Elephant in the room, sometimes the sample prep is not about achieving analytic goals, but ensuring robust instrument performance over the course of thousands of injections, right? Dirty samples kill instruments and ultimately cause de instrument downtime and longevity issues, right? Still, in many instances, we need to do sample prep above and beyond what's needed to keep our instruments clean, just so that we can accomplish the required analysis on that instrument, right? Uh, simple solid phase extraction would be great for 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Nobody wants to do amino acid extraction and PTAD derivatization, but they do it because the instrument doesn't have necessary sensitivity to meet the goal without it. And that's our trade-off, right? And of course, when we're talking about the sample prep, right, we're talking about literally a cost. So. Time is FTE, and FTE is the biggest cost in most of our labs. Right? So it's sort of this question of what do you want to spend your money on, instrument or prep? So I wanted to take an exam two examples from methods which I've seen used, um, one on a 6460 and another in my own lab on a higher level, more sensitive triple quad 6495. Right? Let's take a hypothetical situation where our lab is running, let's say, two runs a week, full 96 well plates each run. Right? I really think these two methods here are going to highlight the trade-off between sample prep and instrument. Now, this is not to say that the 6460 does in itself have some advantages that help the uh, ions go through the obstacle course, but I think you'll see some of the improvements which can come with the higher level instrument. Now, in both of these methods, I will be talking about utilizing electrospray ionization. Right? So we're all probably sick of seeing this ESI figure, right? but I think it deserves talking about a bit because it highlights some points. Um, first, I have to mention that ESI is probably not the best choice for testosterone. ESI is generally going to need some sort of heteroatom to actually generate the ions, which isn't easy on that very hydrophobic steroid structure. APCI is likely a much better choice, but it's not something I have much experience with, so I'm sort of sticking with the devil I know, so to speak. Right? Also, there are things we can do to help with the ionization. Right? So how does electrospray ionization work? We all sort of know this, our, our stream of fluid comes out of the LC, through a charged capillary with nebulizer gas on the outside. It forms that Taylor cone, an aerosol plume, sort of just like your, your can of hairspray. And now those charged molecules in the droplets start to repel each other as the droplet shrinks and gets evaporated, and you get the you know, Raleigh limit coulombic explosions. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is generate these gas phase ions, which can be sucked into your instrument. But this really is an oversimplification of the process, and in particular, some of the options that our analytes have leaving the LC, right? As your analyte is leaving the LC, it can just precipitate as a solid or co-solid, right? And by co-solid, I mean other things coming off the column with your sample can cause loss of the intensity. Or perhaps your analyte can stay in liquid and just spray all over the interface of your MS, right? It could go into the gas phase, but go in uncharged despite your best efforts to charge it. And then it becomes a neutral, and it makes your life even more challenging. Right? Even if it goes in to gas as an ion or an ion cluster, right? then you can have the charge be neutralized or charge stripped, and either way, you don't end up with a charged compound in the gas phase actually reaching your MS. Right? The data I've seen has suggested that it's something like one out of every 10 to the fourth ions which actually hit the detector. Right? So what can we do? So we want to make as many ions as possible. Right? So we can improve our chances here. Testosterone, we're generally going to be working in, in positive mode, so adding some formic acid, ammonium formate can help. Also, as we have a higher organic concentration, that can lead to smaller droplet size, which means there's more likely uh, to form ions. And this rate of ion formation is going to be increased by the concentration of the ions and decreased by increasing droplet size. Right? 
So there's been some advances on ESI. Um, let's look at one of them, which is in use on the 6460. Right, so this is a jet stream. So this is doing what I think almost every manufacturer is doing, where nobody is spraying directly into the MS source, right? We all recognize now the importance of this sort of orthogonal spray, right? And so there have been a few improvements which go into the jet stream to actually try to improve the number of ions going into the MS. Uh, one will be increasing ion formation, and the second will be increasing the ion transmission, decreasing the unwanted, right? So to increase the ion formation, they have this stream of superheated sheath gas, which is going to go through around that charged capillary. Now what that's going to do is actually culminate the nebulizer spray and create this uh, narrower spray, which is going to concentrate our ions. Also the superheated sheath gas is also going to help improve desolvation. So now we have this higher ion concentration smaller droplet size, so increase ionization efficiency. And then we can position a capillary at the prime spot in that stream where we can sample and try to suck in the desired ions with the heated drying gas going on the outside to hopefully keep out the neutrals. And looking at this in pictures, just because it's fun that they can put a camera in a mass spectrometer, you can see um, the green would be the size of the plume without the jet stream. The orange is going to be the size of the plume with the jet stream, and you can see the capillary right there sampling off of it. Now, this has been shown to increase the sensitivity, although this is a good time to mention that it's very hard to get accurate instrument-to-instrument -instrument comparisons, right? Because different instruments can perform differently for different compounds, different sample types, different conditions, et cetera. So very hard to compare between manufacturers. However, certainly within a manufacturer, sometimes you can get a better sense of how they've improved that next model. And that's what you're seeing with Clarum Pentacle there on the chart for with and without the jet stream. All right, so what can we do with an instrument like this? So this is a uh, testosterone method, which was developed and put in use by uh, folks out at Peace Health Labs. Um, this was obviously uh, a little while ago. It was presented in 2014. The details were shared with me by Seafarforth. Um, I think it's a very nice method and something I wanted to, to look into for my own lab. Uh, so they use this three-step sample prep where they do a protein crash followed by solid phase extraction using the bond dilute plexa. They elute with methyltrypto ether, and then they're going to derivatize with hydroxylamine before resuspending in mobile phase and injecting. And here they will quantify on the derivatized testo as shown with the quant and qual. Overall, good chromatography, a three-minute runtime. You can look at the validation data from their 2014 AACC poster, and you can see overall strong performance. Now, one of the things I like about this, and it's very important, is you can see the narrow analytic range, right? They're showing from 0 to 100, and that's very important. Testosterone has a wide dynamic range, and most methods, even the direct amino assays, will do well as you get over 500 or so, and that can really kind of skew your correlation so it looks better than it is. So if you are looking at developing testosterone assay, definitely make sure that you're separating to look at both the above and the below, let's say 100 nanograms per deciliter to really get a sense of how it's performing. So what's contributing to the strong performance of this method? Well, so we have the protein precipitation. The zinc sulfate and the methanol will actually break up uh, the testosterone from testosterone binding proteins, whether sex hormone binding globulin or albumin. And then we have the SPE. Now, in this case, they're using a bond dilute. So this has this hydrophilic outer, hydrophobic inner that can help to trap some of the hydrophobic analytes. So your big things like proteins and other such interferences are going are gonna to wash out, right? So what are the interferences that we really care about in mass spectrometry? So Certainly proteins are one. Um, we could say isobars, except 
you're really unlikely to separate out your isobars using a solid phase extraction. You have to rely on your analytical column for that. Right? One of the big interferences, though, to improve sensitivity will be the phospholipids. Right? These are going to be the second highest lipid content in blood after triglycerides. You're looking at about a milligram per mil in concentration, whereas testosterone is going to be more like 0.1 nanograms per mil. Right? They can be especially problematic when you're doing positive mode ionization due to the ion suppression, and they can be really hard to remove. These phospholipids are going to have this large lipid tail that can drag them along with hydrophobic interaction chemistries, and the Zwitter ionic head can make even ion exchange really challenging. Right? Now, the same thing can be said for liquid-liquid extraction, of course, where they're also going to be extracted with almost anything. Certainly one of the advantages of solid phase extraction is that we have this very wide range of chemistries which are actually possible and allow us to optimize our method for best recovery and cleanup of the sample. It's also automatable, although keep in mind that anytime you want to automate it, that involves an additional expense. Um, some of the, the disadvantages, the increased complexity of the workflow, it's more labor intensive, and there is a cost, right? So if we're looking at about $2 a sample for the SPE supplies in our hypothetical lab of 296 well plates a week, you're looking at about $20,000 a year, 100 k over the course of five years. So a reasonable expense if you're doing it to prevent instrument downtime and keep your instruments clean, but definitely an added expense when you're thinking about what is required for each method. I'm also finding that solid phase extraction just isn't something a lot of people uh, like to do or have experience with. So just a, a quick poll, right? Do you perform solid phase extraction in your lab? Yes, some of you do it manually maybe. Yes, maybe some of you automated it. Yes, and you wish you didn't. Or just no, you're not doing solid phase extraction. So in my own lab, we do do some solid phase extraction, but I, I have to admit I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, it can, however, help with keeping your instruments clean and sensitivity. Another thing that can help with sensitivity is going to be the derivatization, right? So this method on 6460 uses the oxyheme derivatization, right? This is going to work through a variety of mechanisms. The first is just making a non-ionizable non sample more ionizable. Right? So this oxyheme derivatized testosterone can pick up charge better than the non-derivatized testosterone. It's the same way we, same reason we do the PTAD derivatization of 125. Right? So we increase the likelihood of generating um, a charged analyte in the gas phase, independent of what's going on at our instrument. Right. It can also help with our, our chromatography, right? So, so we know that we have these, these zones of inhibition or zones of ion suppression. Um, I superimpose the testosterone and the oxygen testosterone from the Tom Ansley paper, but that Ansley paper is a nice look at sort of these uh, ion suppression studies. And, you know, maybe what we're doing is shifting our compound out of that region where you're having interference. Um, certainly, also doing the oxygen derivatization, it's going to come out a little sooner on your reverse phase column. You can have faster chromatographies. Um, and furthermore, it lets you do a C18 SPE and a C18 analytical phase, which you wouldn't generally do because you want to use orthogonal chemistries, except in this case, since we've derivatized we can still benefit from it, right? So all of this looks looks great, and it, and it works quite well. Um, but what could we do with a slightly higher level triple quad, something like the 6495, and what actually goes, in, goes into that instrument to make it, quote unquote, higher sensitivity, right? So let's just remember the ion optical course that we want. So somehow our quote unquote better instrument needs to get more of those ions we're losing or prevent those ions we don't want from getting through in order for us to be able to reduce sample prep. So the, the 6495 is, is going to use that same jet stream um, functionality. However, in this case, what they realized is that while we're sort of trying to get the 
sampling at that sweet spot, we're still missing a lot. Right? So one of the improvements was the introduction of this hexabore capillary, which, just like it sounds like, is six capillaries. Now, I strongly advocated that they have 11 capillaries, um, but they told me they can't do that. Um, so I guess I've been watching too much Spinal Tap. But you know, it's, it's actually interesting to me, because I would have thought that just a larger capillary would do a better job sampling. It's probably why they don't let me divine, design mass spectrometers, right? Because as I'm told, this larger capillary actually doesn't accomplish that. Um, you get some, some turbulent flow issues and things like that. However, having these, these six capillaries all around it does allow for much greater sampling of ions. So we're getting more ions from the, from the stream into the MS. However, we're also getting a lot of other things, right? So a lot more gas. And this is going to cause a problem later on. And so how do we how do we deal with this? So the way you can deal with this in the 6495 is the next step is they have this dual ion funnel. So our little ion is going to take its path from its jet stream, get sucked into one of those six hexabore capillaries, get guided down into this high pressure funnel. And you'll note that the entrance from the hexabore capillary to the high pressure funnel and the entrance or the exit from the high pressure funnel to the exit of the low pressure funnel or offset, right? So this is going to, to help us to avoid contamination of neutrals, right? And using the two funnels, the high pressure and the low pressure, is actually going to allow us to deal with that increased volume of gas coming through, pump it down without Im negatively impacting uh, the lifetime of the pump. So then after it, it goes through the ion funnel, well, let me just say that I always think it's interesting to think, you know, the ion funnel, I think about hurting people, right? And if we look a little more closely, that's really exactly what it's doing, right? We have these RF voltages, which are focusing our ions of interest into the center. And we have a DC voltage, which is actually sort of forcing them out down through the funnel. So what we're left with is this focused beam of highly concentrated ions with um, gas and neutrals and all of that hopefully not making it through and not being focused. Right? Finally, we know that most of these times we're doing MSMS, and most of what I've talked about is optimizing generating parent ions, but there's also a daughter ion we need to measure, right? And so there's ways to optimize how many of the daughter ions you're generating and actually transmitting down through the mass spectrometer, right? So the 6495s are going to use this, this curved uh, hexapole collision cell. And it's, it's tapered, so you have it a little higher at the beginning so that more gets through, and then they get focused and, and transferred, transferred down. So I would be lying if I said I understood all of the improvements that go into this. Um, but at least I wanted to try to understand whether I was being sold a load of goods or whether there was actually some, some science behind these, these improvements. So is there any science behind this, right? So what can we do with this sort of 6495 instrument? So this is the testosterone method, which we've developed in my lab. Um, here what we're going to be working with is 100 microliters of plasma serum. We incubate with our C13 internal standard for mycosciences. And then after an incubation step, we add 300 microliter of methyl terpeneal ether, resuspend, mix, dry it down. We're able to concentrate here by resuspending with 100 microliters of mobile phase. And then we're going to inject. Now, I'll mention here that my chromatography is much larger, much, much longer. Right? So I'm looking at nine and a half minute run to run. But that's based on other considerations. I can definitely shorten that. And I'm using methanol instead of acetonitrile, right? But still sticking with that, that C18 column. And you can see my quant and qualifier ion there for testosterone coming out at about 5.1 minutes. So how does this assay perform? So we compared ourselves to a reference laboratory. This is a Dean Carlos method for measurement of testosterone and estradiol where he has also uh, run those CDC host samples. And you can see at that low end, below 40, we have very good agreement with a passing bat block slope of 1.06 R squared greater than 0 0.99. There were also three samples which had 
below the one nanogram per deciliter lower lumina quantitation. Um, so that gives me confidence that I'm not picking up some interferences, right? So where does this, where does this leave us, right? So I think where it leaves us is you really do have these options, right? We can do accurate low-level testosterone method measurements with something like a 6495 and a little more straightforward, simpler sample handling. We could also do it on a 6460. We just need to maybe have a little more sample prep involved, right? So what's going to work better for your lab? This was uh, a nice little survey I saw from Chromatography Online where they were just asking people, how much time do you spend on the different processes, right? And, you know, I would contend that this is maybe underestimating the time most of us spend on data management. It's at about 27%. But you can see that the sample processing, 61%, consumes the bulk of our time. I know in my laboratory, it is incredibly challenging to find certified licensed technologists who are able to work in the lab and do these more advanced instrumentation uh, methods, including some of the sample prep, right? And so certainly when, when I was thinking about the methods, I know either one can work, but I felt for me personally in my lab, being able to put out that investment and have a slightly better instrument um, is going to save me a lot more in terms of the labor costs, right? But keep in mind, both accomplish the exact same assay, you know, low-level testosterone measurement. Um, it's just a question of where your trade-offs are, where your pain points are, right? And I think ultimately, for me, too, thinking about what next steps might be in my laboratory, right? What is the next assay I'd like to do? Expanding our testosterone assay to a full steroid panel, which might be more possible on this higher level instrument. Um, but I really don't think that there is a right or wrong here. It really is just thinking about the sample prep involved and whether that fits your lab or whether you possibly need to consider another direction. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayden, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many times as questions as you have time for today. So let's look at our audience questions as they're coming in. Our first question is, is there a mid-level MS instrument option? Yeah, so if I'm understanding correctly, the question is, and I'm just going to flip back in slides, is there something on the middle of this curve? You know, if you, if you can't afford the highest level, but you're not convinced that you can do the solid phase extraction, the derivatization, and, and the answer is, Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, there there is a, a mid-level instrument, which we have we have them the 6470 sitting in our lab, which we use for for other techniques. Um, I've certainly been thinking about looking at what it would require for that instrument to be able to to do uh, testosterone measurement. You know, um, can I just do the liquid liquid extraction? Doesn't look like. That's necessarily going to be an option, but could I do something like a, a straightforward SPE if perhaps I wanted to save myself the derivatization? Um, and looking like that might be possible, also exploring different derivatizations. Um, but I would say there, there's definitely a range of options you can use. You just have to be aware of what sort of sample prep procedure is going to be necessary and where's that trade-off between the instrument performance and the amount of sample prep involved. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Here's our second question. What impact do you see on your precision from extra sample prep? Uh, okay, so what, what impact does extra sample prep have on the precision of, of the instrument? All right, so my, my general gestalt, I guess I would say, is that 
the more you manipulate a sample, the less precision you have, right? So more steps involved is more opportunity for variable performance, variable sample loss. So, you know, doing a three-step sample prep or multiple solid phase extractions, each one of those is going to introduce variability and affect your overall precision. Um, so I didn't talk about that, but I do believe that your precisions, your CVs, are going to be helped by simpler sample prep. Giant caveat there, right, two of them. One is, to reiterate again, sample prep helps keep your instrument clean, and cleaner instruments perform better over the long time. Um, and then second thing is robots don't make mistakes, right? Um, so if you are automating your sample preparation as a way of fixing this, you know, amount of time spent on sample processing, then you're probably going to see very minimal impact on your precision with automation. Although, you know, I'm not sure I have sufficient data to really uh, support that statement I just made. But in general, robots are going to have less variability. Um, so. I think you're going to increase imprecision with more sample prep, but you can mitigate that by having automated sample prep. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. And thank you to our audience today for your participation. Wonderful questions. We have time for one more question before we end. Dr. Hayden, why liquid extraction and not SPE in the 6495 method? Yeah, so why did we go with the liquid-liquid extraction? So I think that this is sort of an interesting um, preference. So I sort of started, I trained working in labs that were very comfortable doing liquid-liquid extraction. I think it's relatively straightforward. I think there are ways for you to choose the appropriate liquid-liquid solvent to do the extraction so you can get some of that selectivity you might see with solid phase extraction. And, you know, as a consequence of that, I'm sort of fond of liquid-liquid extraction, whereas I have less experience with solid phase extraction. And, you know, the experience I've, I've had where you're working with a positive pressure manifold or a vacuum manifold, you know, it works fine, but it, it has its own idiosyncrasies, which I'm not as familiar with. Now, all this having been said, I know a number of people who simply won't do liquid-liquid extraction. And I think some of that probably has to do with the volume. So I've rarely worked in a situation where I'm processing, you know, two, three plates a day. And so liquid-liquid extraction has kind of typically been a workflow option for me, although it is harder to automate liquid-liquid extraction. Um, there are our sample handlers that can absolutely pipette organic solvents. So the, um, you know, the Hamiltons, I think really, I've seen them excel at that, um, which is not to say others can or can't, just that my experience has been seeing Hamiltons do it quite well. Um, but it is definitely still harder, and there's a lot of considerations if you want to automate your liquid-liquid extraction, where solid phase extraction is a little easier to automate. So some people prefer that. Um, I don't know. I've certainly thought about trying a solid phase extraction for our testosterone even on C495 just to see what it would look like and how that workflow looks relative to the LLE. So I know that doesn't really give you any data-driven answer. It's just to say it's what I've done, it's what I've seen, it's what I'm comfortable with. Um, so it's what we did, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. And thank you so much again for your presentation. I know that you and Agilent Technologies, our sponsor, are willing to take um, any additional questions by email. Did you want to have any closing remarks before we close today? Um, you know, certainly, as you said, feel free to, to reach out with questions. Um, you know, I've learned so much from speaking with other folks in the field and just trying to learn from them. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to share that. Or maybe if you have a question, it highlights something that I myself don't know well enough yet. And so it would be good for me to find out the answer to it. So, yeah, definitely please feel free to reach out. 
And I'd like to once again thank you again for your presentation. And also thank you LabRoots and our sponsor Agilent Technologies for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.